Mints with scales, <laughs> not fish scales, but the kind of scales that tell you how much you weigh. I've stood on the scales and stared at the number and said, no, no, you can't be right. You can't be right. You're inaccurate. You're overweighing me. I'm not that heavy. You're wrong. But the scales never reply. <laughs> they never argue. The scales never defend themselves. Does no good to argue with scales about your weight. Did you already know that? Does no good to argue with the mirror about your appearance. I've done that too. Some years ago, Dean Lynn commented, thank you, honey, on my bald spot. <laughs> Apparently it was spreading on my scalp years before I noticed it, but thanks to my wife, I'm ignorant no longer. I hurried to the bathroom mirror and I held up a hand mirror so I could see the back of my head. There it was. Is sitting on my scalp like a yarmulke, <laughs> spreading like an amoeba. There it was. You've seen monks who have a saucer-sized circle on their heads? Well, I qualify. I could be a monk. I filed my complaint with the mirrors. You must be incorrect. No reply. They, like the bathroom scales, are impervious to objections. So is the radar gun. <laughs> You're laughing because you've argued with the radar gun, haven't you? That can't be true, officer. I was not speeding. The radar gun says otherwise. End of discussion. Case closed. No rebuttal allowed. It's hard to deny the facts when the facts stare you square in the face. In the story of Jacob, God gave him a face full of facts in a distant land by the name of Haran. You'll need to make note of that because this is where Jacob is going to be for a while. Haran, H-A-R-A-N. You'll find his 20-year sojourn there. One of the most curious, intriguing, and entertaining stories in the Bible. Can a man actually marry one woman all the while thinking he's marrying someone else? Would a swindler ever be outswindled by another swindler? Genesis 29 offers answers. Before we follow Jacob up to Haran, can we just review the storyline? We're in lesson number five of a 12-part series on the life of Jacob. And we're seeing that God is shaping Jacob. From the top of Jacob's ladder, God spoke to him. And he said, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Jacob has a royal responsibility. He's a player in heaven's highest quest, the deliverance of Jesus to earth. God had high plans for Jacob, but Jacob had deep flaws. His rap sheet included words like cheater, trickster, drifter, grifter. But God kept him on the team. Odd, I know, because when you read the story of Jacob, he really seems more at home in a Las Vegas casino than a church sanctuary. He's a bit of a mess, this Jacob, and aren't we all? If you're not, I hearken back to the opening paragraph of the opening message and say again, then this story is not for you. If your halo sits like a tiara on your royal head, if your doubts are non-existent, then you're going to find Jacob to be a flop. The rest of us find Jacob to be a friend. 
like him, our spiritual walk seems to follow this crooked path. Our spiritual cheese keeps falling off our crackers. Our bad habits have a way of scuttling our good intentions. And we wonder, sometimes we wonder, don't we all wonder, does God have a place for someone like me? The answer through Jacob is God uses flawed folks. He uses flawed folks. He keeps us on his team. He will use us, but he needs to shape us in order to use us. Indulge a couple of big words here that theologians use to describe this process, justification and sanctification. Justification happens when we give our lives to Christ. We are justified Sanctification happens as we grow in our relationship with Christ. We're in the process of being sanctified. Justification is a one-time, irrevocable event. Entirely God's work. Perfectly complete at the moment it happens. You cannot be more justified than you already are. It's the same for all Christians. Sanctification, however, is the process of being turned into a saint. Sanctification. We are being sanctified, increasingly made holy. And this process continues throughout life. Every event, every encounter, every experience is God's way of sanctifying us. And it requires our participation. This work is never complete this side of heaven. And it's greater in some than it is in others. So the terms are simple. Justification is God's work for you. Sanctification is God's work in you. You, like Jacob, are a part of of God's team. You're a part of his courier delivery system of hope. You, like Jacob, have a few areas in your life uh, that are a bit rough. And so he pulls out, excuse me, the sandpaper and helps us deal with our foibles, helps us deal with our flaws, as Paul said. So God is at work in you. Where? In you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. This is reiterated reiterated in a book called Hebrews, where the writer says that God will equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working where, church? In you, that which is pleasing in his sight. It really helps you to know that God is working in you. And sometimes this work is a blessing. Sometimes this work feels like a burden. But you are being shaped just as Jacob was. You are being shaped every event, every day. God takes you into his workshop and he works on you. And sometimes he will take us to our version of Haran. Now, Jacob's version of this distant country sat some 550 miles from southern Israel, where our story begins. And in order to reach Haran, he had to travel east across the Jordan River, north toward Damascus, east to Tadmor, and then make a sharp north for the final leg of his journey. That took him over the Euphrates River landing him in what is today the southern portion of Turkey, Mesopotamia. <clears throat> Excuse me. His mother came up with this plan of sending him to Haran. Does anyone remember his mother's name? Yes, Rebecca. Her plan was simple. Send Jacob to a safe place where he could stay with her brother. His name, her brother's name, you'll need to know as well, was Laban. 
L-A-B-A-N, Laban. She wanted to send Jacob there for just a few months so that Esau's anger could subside. And while he's up there, you never know, he might meet a pretty sweet young thing and come home with a wife. <clears throat> so Jacob thought he was going to Haran to hang out with Laban and maybe meet a wife. God, however, sent Jacob to Haran so that Jacob could step on the scales. It was time for him to look in the mirror. It was time for him to read the radar gun. It was time for Jacob to face the facts about Jacob. Turns out Jacob had not a bald spot, but a blind spot. So here's what happened. The first thing that Jacob saw in Haran was a water well. And the well was covered and protected by a large stone. A stone so large that it required at least three men to move it. Three shepherds stood near the stone. Jacob asked the shepherds if they knew a man by the name of Laban. And they said they did. <clears throat> While Jacob was in conversation with them, Rachel came up with her father's sheep. She was the shepherd. The moment Jacob spotted Rachel daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, saw her arriving with his uncle Laban's sheep, he went and single-handedly rolled the stone from the mouth of the well. You can chuckle a little bit here. <clears throat> and he watered the sheep of his uncle Laban. Then he kissed Rachel and broke into tears. <laughs> oh, what a moment. Let's imagine Rachel with dark hair that is gathered at the nape of her neck with a scarlet string. And she has eyes the color of chocolate and shaped like almonds. Her chin has a slight cleft. She shepherds this flock by waving a willow branch and walking in grace. Oh, she's a portrait of charm, this Rachel. And Jacob would have agreed. One side of her, and did you see what he did? He ripped open his shirt, exposing the S on his chest. <laughs> and he flexed his pecs, and he pressed his shoulder against the stone, and he gave it a heave, and one man did what three men were needed to do. The stone gave way. And then he did what no one, hang on to your hat, what no one imagined he would do. Then he kissed Rachel and he broke into tears. Now the commentaries I read to prepare for this message agree that this was probably a response Respectful and expected peck on the cheek. I disagree. <laughs> I see more passion in this moment. I see him cupping her beautiful face in his hands and him planting a kiss on her like it was their wedding day. And then he broke into tears. He buried his face in her neck and he wept. He wept at the thought that the journey was over. He wept at the possibility that the wife was found. He wept that he, Jacob, ever the grifter and drifter, the cheat, the swindler, would be given a woman, this beautiful. The name Rachel means you, not Y-O-U. But E-W-E, -E, as in you lamb. The moment Jacob saw her, he said, I want you. <laughs> Y'all don't know how long it takes to think these things up.
He immediately asked her father, what was his name? Laban, if he could marry her. Here's Laban, prepare yourself. Part P.T. Barnum, part Bernie Madoff. Both circus promoter and Ponzi meister. The guy could put his arm around your shoulder and slip the wallet out of your hip pocket and you'd never know it. He wore a silk shirt unbuttoned all the way down to the navel (laughs) and a gold chain around his neck and gold rings on each pinky. He had grocery store hair dye. (laughs) The color of his hair didn't match his sideburns. And he gave Jacob a squeeze. Oh, Rebecca's boy. We've been waiting for you. You will come to my tent. You will live in my house. You will want for nothing as long as you are here. Within an hour, Jacob was lounging on a carpet with his uncle, eating olives and drinking wine and discussing Laban's daughters. Jacob, who had moved the stone to impress Rachel, was willing to move heaven and earth to marry her. What would you take in exchange for the hand of Rachel? Laban put his hand over his heart and said, Oh, (laughs) Rachel, mm, I could never give up my precious Rachel. I'll work for her, Jacob said. Oh, I could never accept the labor of my sister's son. I'll tend your flocks for a year. Oh, but Rachel... She is my special daughter. I'll serve for three years. But Rachel is just so beautiful. Four years back and forth, they volleyed until finally Jacob agreed to work seven years for only room and board if only he could marry Rachel. Remember, this is Jacob. Remember, he's the grandson of Abraham, who was a wealthy man, maybe the wealthiest in the promised land, and here he is working for free. Either Rachel was drop-dead gorgeous or Laban was charlatan shrewd. I suspect both were the case. Some of the Bible's most poetic language was used to describe the romance between Jacob and Rachel. Still your beating heart as you read this. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Ah. All would have gone well had Laban been, not been such a, a backroom dealer How many of you knew that he had another daughter? And she was older than Rachel. And she was not quite as pretty as Rachel. Scripture describes her. The language is a bit cryptic. Leah's eyes were delicate. Leah had delicate eyes. But Rachel was beautiful of form and Appearance. The implication is her eyes didn't have that sparkle. They were soft. They weren't arresting and dynamic like Rachel was. Whereas the name Rachel meant, does anybody remember? You. The name Leah meant, please don't get mad at me. The name Leah meant cow. So you have you and moo. (laughs) Was this a (laughs) reflection? I just made that up. It's not even in my notes. The, the, The first service didn't get the you and moo thing. 
Was this a reflection on her appearance? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What we can say with certainty is that Rachel was heading to the wedding altar while her big sister was not. Laban had other plans. I do not know how to say switcheroo in Hebrew, but Laban pulled off the biggest one in the Bible. Are you ready? The day of the wedding arrived. Seven years of labor was completed. Jacob was a man in love. Rachel was a bride-to-be. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place, and he made a feast. Yet Laban, he invited everyone. The brickmakers, the goat herds, the shepherds, the grain-growing farmers, the camel-riding merchants. Everyone came. Now, this name translated feast is literally drink fest. Drink fest. Wine flowed like water that day. Everyone drank. Everyone danced. There was hand clapping, music making, joke telling, back slapping, drum beating, meat eating, feet kicking, sandals stomping. <laughs> and just when they thought they could drink no more, they did just that. Meanwhile, the women prepared the bridal tent. They covered the ground with carpets. They perfumed the air with incense. And they placed lamps ever so dimly lit on the table. <clears throat> the sun set. And when the sun set, the stage was set for the magic moment. The stars were diamonds on velvet. Laban fetched the bride and led her to the tent. She had been kept out of sight all day. By the time it was time for Jacob to consummate his marriage, he was so drunk he could hardly see what he was doing. At least that's the explanation that makes the most sense to me for what is about to happen. The next morning, with the fog cleared from his brain and the wine flushed out of his system, he rolled over in bed expecting to see his lovely Rachel and holy cow.
mind, blinded by night, blinded by lust, and blindly in love. Number two, Jacob, who begrudged and resisted the tradition of the firstborn going first, fell victim to Laban's explanation that it was wrong to give the younger before the firstborn. Number three, when Jacob filed his complaint with Laban, he said, why did you, what's the word? Cheat me using the very same word. That Esau used. Jacob has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, he has taken away my blessing. Remember how Jacob inveigled the birthright from his firstborn older brother? Remember how Jacob deceived his father Isaac? Remember the phrase, a taste of your own medicine? Jacob was handed a spoonful. Knowing that Jacob would agree, Laban offered to let Jacob marry Rachel as well. The condition, what? Uh, Seven more years of labor. Verse 28 is as terse as Jacob's expression must have been. Jacob agreed. He finished the seven-day honeymoon with Leah. Then he got married and set about the task of working seven more years. Something tells me the second wedding was a little more subdued than the first. Chapter 29 ends with Jacob having sister wives. One wanted, the other unwanted. And seven more years of work to fulfill and plenty of time to ponder a fundamental, reoccurring principle from Scripture. You know what it is? You cannot cheat God. People harvest only what they plant. You farmers get this. You gardeners get this. You plant a seed, you know what you're going to get. And that's true in life. God sent Jacob to Haran so Jacob could see what it's like to be Jacobed, to be cheated by someone else. Because Jacob had planted seeds of deceit, he now harvested a crop of deceit. He fooled Esau, he fooled Isaac, and now he was fooled by Laban. (sighs) Closing questions. You think God still sends people to Haran? Do we still reap what we sow? Do you think? Am I talking to anyone whose life right now feels like Jacob's must have felt? You're wondering how in the world you got here. Maybe you feel tricked, hoodwinked, swindled. You find yourself far from home, maybe far from hope, Far from the life you'd hoped for, you're several semesters into the University of Hard Knocks, and you just don't see graduation on the calendar. If that describes you, I know you're tempted to blame Leah, to blame Laban, but please, maybe it's time to take a good long look at the mirror. And ask the question, God, what are you saying to me? In what way are you shaping me, sanctifying me? Please, my friend, God did not intend for you to lead a life of misery, of chaos, of confusion. But if a season of misery is what it takes to get your attention, then pay attention. God left Jonah in the belly of a whale, Peter in the pit of regret. Saul did become Paul, but only after God knocked Saul off his high horse on the way to Damascus. Is God talking to you? Here's the question. What seeds are you sowing today? You want to have a bright future? Then sow good seeds today. 
You want to have a future full of hope, then sow seeds of hope today. Do you want to have a future of blessings, then sow seeds of blessings today. You determine the quality of tomorrow by the seeds you sow today. You determine the quality of tomorrow by the seeds you sow today. Young people, can I talk to you for just a second? As you look around and you see old people like the one talking to you now, you see some people grow old in peace with joy, with hope. You know why? Because when they were your age, they sowed seeds of peace and joy and hope. Amen from the older generation. You look around and you see people whose lives at this age are just disarranged, chaotic, splintered, hardly a happy relationship in their world. You know why? Because when they were your age, they sowed seeds of deceit, dishonesty, and bitterness. Scripture is really clear on this that when we sow the wind, we reap the whirlwind. Sow seeds of chaos, you're going to reap a life of chaos. Or as the wise man said, when you're kind to others, you help yourself. When you're cruel to others, guess what? You hurt yourself. You sow the seeds of tomorrow's life. I wonder, did Jacob learn his lesson? Well, it's going to take another few chapters for us to find the answer. This much is sure. God chose Jacob and chose to use him, but he had to shape him to do so. He has chosen you, my friend, and me, but he is shaping us so he can use us. One redeeming detail to this sordid story that needs to be mentioned. Remember Leah? Remember the elder sister? Remember the unwanted sister? Remember the girl with the soft eyes and the unfortunate name? Well, guess what? She became the mother of a son by the name of Judah. And among her descendants were a shepherd boy in Bethlehem by the name of David. And then later, a carpenter in Nazareth by the name of Jesus. Yeah. Leah, unchosen by Jacob, was chosen by God to be the mother of the bloodline of the king of kings. Oh, how the ironies continue. Gracious Heavenly Father, what would you now have us to learn from this lesson, from this story? We bless you, Lord. Speak to us, please. Through the name of Christ, we pray. And all the church said, amen. Let's all be standing for a time of prayer. Oh, we cherish these stories. Aren't we glad that these stories about real people with real struggles are in the Bible because we are real people with real struggles. And if God can use them, he can use us. If you would like to receive prayer, please, as we're beginning this prayer time, just step out into the aisle and come to the front. Maybe you're passing through a time of physical affliction financial challenge, maybe a relationship issue, maybe your concern for your family, for your friends, for your future, then let me pray for you. Just don't be embarrassed. Come to the front and we'll pray for you. And we'll use this time, all of us, whether we're in the front or standing where we are or watching online, to turn our hearts toward our master, our heavenly father, the same one who helped Jacob is here to help us. Let's take a few Just a few seconds and let everybody come to the front who desires to do so.
please speak words of mercy over this, your flock, O shepherd, words of kindness over these, your children, those in need of strength, those whose hearts are broken, those whose lives have been shattered, those whose plans have been disrupted, those whose sleep is seldom, those whose health is fragile. Please speak words of blessing. We really need supernatural help. In these days in which there's so much anxiety, so much fear, so much polarization, would you, Heavenly Father, speak over your children, please? In these next moments of silence, just tell the Lord whatever's on your heart and receive what he says to you. Those of you watching online, we're praying with you, praying for you. Those of you watching from around the world, we pray a blessing on your country, upon your homeland, upon your faith. Lord God, we're united by our longing for you. Thank you. And now as we're saying amen, would you say thank you, Lord? Let's just say it out loud, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We have officially left our burdens at the throne of God. Just leave them there. They're gone. I hope you feel a little bit lighter. And when you reach up to take those burdens back, may the Spirit tell you, oh, no, I've got those. I've got those. He's gone ahead of you. Amen.